is also someone that I've known, had a great amount of history with over the years. I want to share a little secret with you. How many of you ever have heard of Forbes magazine? Raise your hands. Great. And how about the publisher, Rich, who's on the news all the time? Well, he has espoused to me that John Buckingham is the single most important genius he's met in his career lifetime, and he also has said that he's the only man that he lets to manage his money because he's a brilliant stock picker, and you will see that. John Buckingham has been with Al Frank Asset Management since 1987 and the company's largest shareholder. He has served as the firm's director of research since 1989 and the chief portfolio manager since 1990. He also is the editor of the Prudent Speculator Newsletter, a top-ranked investment newsletter according to Mark Holbert and the Holbert Financial Digest, but he is a brilliant stock picker and a market technician. So please give a warm welcome to John Buckingham. Holy moly, with that introduction, I better be good. <laughs> so the topic of my presentation is the secret to success in stocks. Anybody know what it is? Every time I ask the question, the people in the front row always say buy low, sell high. Well, that all sounds good in theory, right? Um, but it's easier said than done. Hopefully we have my presentation here somewhere. There we go. Al Frank was the founder of, the, of uh, our firm, uh, launched the Prudent Speculator Newsletter in 1977. I'm sure many of you saw him speak because he was one of the first uh, speakers, I guess, on the circuit uh, for the Money Show. Happily, he brought me on board and I've been uh, speaking at these events probably for 20 years now, uh, maybe longer, maybe 25 years. But one of the things that Al taught us was that successful speculating is more a matter of character than mathematics, analysis, or luck. And hopefully uh, the slideshow will uh, be able to see the bottom of it on your screen. Hopefully the folks in the back can fix that. Because a lot of the things that I talk about are numerically driven. We have lots of data. <laughs> I am a numbers cruncher. And the nice thing about the stock market and the stock market data that exists is that it, it will show you that equities have historically provided fantastic returns for those who remember the secret to success, which is not to get scared out of stocks. And unfortunately, it looks like the presentation may not uh, be there, but at least you can see me in the top half there. And there's also a picture in the bottom half, and um, I'll walk you through some of this. But the idea is that the message I've been, I've been preaching and that Al Frank was preaching for all those years hasn't changed. Um, whether the Dow is at 18,000, at 24,900 and change where it is today, or at 7,000 or so where it was back in 2008, uh, the message uh, has been consistent. Let's see if my slides aren't going to advance, are they? Any luck in the back with uh, fixing that, hopefully? No, no luck? Well, I'll continue then without slides, which uh, hopefully I won't have to dance or anything like that. But one of my favorite quotations is, if you do not change direction, you may end up where you are heading. And hopefully that resonates with people because so many investors start off on the right path. They have their portfolios all set up with, with what they think is their proper risk tolerance. And of course, they choose their risk tolerance during benign periods in the market, right? And then you have an event like we had in February, and everybody decides that, oh, I guess I couldn't handle the kind of risk um, that I thought I could handle. And so you can get off the path to achieving your long-term investment objectives. Now, if we had the slides, I would, the next slide in the presentation would show you the S&P 500's return well, hey, we got something, at least half a, half a slide. At least we have the moral of the story, don't get scared out of stocks on that page. Um, because the trend of the stock market is higher. 
Yay, there we go. We'll have half a presentation. Um, the, the chart on the top is, is a chart of the S&P 500 going back to the 1920s. Um, you can see there are a couple of spikes in there, and those spikes, stop it, those spikes are, are um, the more recent movements up and down. And the slide below, the part of which you can't see, is a log scale, which shows that there is a lot of volatility along the way. But again, the overall trend in the market is higher. And we try to provide perspective to our readers and managed account clients. Oh boy, we're getting better. Um, this slide here is showing you the crisis events, the scary things that have happened in time, and then the subsequent returns, one year, two year, three years, five years, and since they have happened. And you can see that the events that at that moment may have appeared incredibly frightening have actually blended away and been forgotten in the fullness of time. You know, I speak on the uh, Ford's Money Show Investment Cruises. We happened to pick a good time to go to Australia this year um, because we got on board the ship on February 4th. Um, and on February 5th, we had the little correction in the market um, in one day <laughs> where we had a gigantic, you know, 1,100 point decline in the Dow. So you have scary events that have occurred, but I bet that many of you don't remember what day we had another big decline in the Dow of 1,000 points or so. Was it February 8th? Was it February 6th? Was it February 12th? At that moment, you thought you dang well knew that it had happened. But over time, the memories fade, and all of these, these frightening events, and I know you can't really see it, but you know the Cuban Missile Crisis and, and uh, oil shocks and all of those sorts of things give way, ultimately, to higher prices. And this is one of my favorite charts, and you can't even see the bottom of it, but it points out that a big market decline happens every year. We have been publishing The Prudent Speculator for 41 years. And in 25 of those 41 years, there has been a decline within the year of at least 10%. So if a 10% decline scares you and is going to cause you to get out of the stock market, please do so today. Don't wait because I can guarantee you it's going to happen again. And what kind of decline did we have so far this year? A 10% decline. And if you listen to the media, of course, the world was ending. I mean, it was shocking like how this was some event that was, was like unprecedented. And of course, we have our, our uh, reigning uh, octogenarian, John Bogle of Vanguard, who claimed on television that it was the most volatile market environment he has ever seen in his 66-year investment career. Now, John has been maybe smoking something. Maybe he was with the cannabis folks. <laughs> but I can assure you that that is factually incorrect. The thing that drives me nuts is when people get on television or even at these shows and say things that aren't true. It is not true. This was not the most volatile market environment. Does anybody remember 2008? How about 2011? You know, we've had tremendous volatility in the market in years past, and we, of course, actually show you the data. And if you come to my talk, my workshop, um, I will show you that data that illustrates the point that John Bogle is wrong. It's not the most volatile market environment he's ever seen. And we've had recent, more recent events, of course, including the Trump election. Uh, recall that before the election, uh, just about every billionaire CNBC could find was telling you the stock market would crash if Trump was elected. Um, Carl Icahn, of course, said the same thing, but then he went long in the wee hours of the night and, and supposedly made a fortune um, because of his great market timing. But the moral of this story is that stocks will advance, stocks survive the difficult things, but you have to be braced and prepared for difficulties in the market environment. Unfortunately, it's not easy today. You know, the little smartphones we have, these little guys, these are not your friend. Um, please put this away if you, you are here during market hours so that if I tell you about a stock, you don't run out and buy it that second. Um, 
it's great to have access to information, but unfortunately most people can't handle access to information. You know, the reason that you don't worry so much about your real estate is it doesn't get valued every second or millisecond. You can't track the price of your house on your smartphone where well, you can if you use a Zillow app. You know, my house went up like $500,000 in a day um, because a comp sale, you know, made it look a lot better. Um, but you can't trade your house. Unfortunately, you can click a button literally and liquidate your investment portfolio and you can do so without it costing you anything. You know, when I started in this business in 1987, it was $39.95 a, mi a minimum a trade at Charles Schwab, a discount broker. And I would assert that most investors did better in those days because there was a barrier to trading. I.e., I don't want to spend, you know, 40 bucks to sell each position in my portfolio. If I have 20 stocks in my account, it's 800 bucks. I'm not going to do anything. And that's generally the right advice. So the constant checking of your portfolio generally is hazardous to your wealth. And then, of course, we have lots of people uh, who will help you lose money. Um, including the bald-headed fellow up there, uh, Jim Kramer. Nothing against Jim personally. Um, he does try to help people. Um, but the sense that you have to react to every little event and that you have to quote-unquote do something about it is generally speaking, again, not uh, conducive to growing your portfolio. But we live in a sensationalistic world. You know, I can't come up here and say, well, gee, you know, we've made, you know, 17% a year for 41 years in our investment newsletter, the best performing um, publication in the land. That's boring, right? Who wants to make 17% a year for 41 years? Well, Warren Buffett does. He's almost at that level. But that's, that doesn't sound very exciting. But, you know, Dow 50,000 or the market's going to crash 30% next week, that might get your attention. As well as uh, magazine covers like Ebola is coming. The irony of that is that the, the way the magazine world works is you have to produce your cover like a week before you go to press. Well, Ebola had already left by the time this magazine cover came out. But you have to, you have to do something like that to get noticed. Or even The Economist with its Acropolis Now. Um, anybody remember when the uh, Greek debt crisis was? 2010. Is the Greek uh, financial crisis, debt crisis over today? No. Well, what if you had said, well, I got to wait until that's resolved. I can't invest in equities. Well, the chart here is showing you the blue line is, is what you would have made by investing in, in stocks. And then the other lines are what you would have made investing in quote unquote safer instruments or in gold. So the moral of the story, again, is that there will be scary things that happen, and they will happen again, but your job is to stay focused on your long-term investment objectives and to, frankly, ignore a lot of the noise that is out there, both on the positive side and the negative side. I'm afraid the Crash of 2016 book is probably not going to be a bestseller anymore. <laughs> and the Dow 36,000, you remember when that came out? Well, there, eventually Mr. Glassman's going to be right. We will get to Dow 36,000. If we get there at the normal rate of appreciation in the Dow Jones Industrial Average, which is a price-weighted index, and you don't get credit for the dividends, um, so the Dow gains about 5.5% a year, it'll be the year 2025. So let's get back together here in 2025 and see if I'm right about Dow 36,000. Now... At least those people are actually paid to publish a book. The stuff that's available online is downright frightening. Um, this particular one, again, the collapse of 2016, uh, didn't quite come true. And then, of course, you also have the Dow 50,000 uh, story on there. And the reason I put these up is that when we get to the next slide, it's from the same gosh darn website. This is actually a, a page from you know, a screenshot. So the Dow's either going to go down 50%, or the market will go down 50%, or we'll get to Dow 50,000. So the, how does that help you as an investor? Well, it doesn't, of course. But if one of those you know, outlying events actually occurs, then these folks will be geniuses. And more importantly, they're going to try to either scare the bejesus out of you, right? Or they're going to play on greed. So fear and greed are always those things that you have to understand are, are omnipresent. 
And market history also shows, the data shows that investors are awful market timers. So please, please don't try to time the market. Um, Dalbar publishes information every year to show how bad mutual fund investors are in their timing. And so um, those who constantly try to, of course, buy low and sell high, unfortunately often end up buying high and selling low. And we see this in mutual fund flow data. We see it in sentiment surveys. You know, it is fascinating. You know, I, I wish that I, I will, maybe we'll do a show of hands here. You know, how many of you, and this is patterned after the American Association of Individual Investors who asks, you know, over the next six months, do you think six months from now the Dow Jones Industrial Average will be higher or lower? How many of you think the Dow will be higher? How many think it will be lower? Oh. Well, most of you are asleep and didn't vote, so that's... <laughs> so so my, my study wasn't scientific, but unfortunately there were more people who were optimistic than pessimistic. So that would be a contra-negative. On, on the other side of the coin, if you came to hear me speak, you are one of the smarter investors, and therefore your optimism is probably correct as opposed to the average investors who is incorrect. <laughs> Thank you. So Kim said that I was a, 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 a you know, super duper stock picker. I'll, I'll try to be humble and say I'm a better than average stock picker, but what I am is a super duper uh, stock holder. And stock holding is the key to investment success. And so, you know, Mark Holbert was nice enough to uh, write a, a piece for us in Barron's last year. Oh my goodness, my time is getting short. Um, Mark was nice enough to write a piece in Barron's um, and basically said that the secret to our success is nerves of steel. And I say, amen. That's correct, because it doesn't matter what stocks I, I choose if you're sitting in cash. So I spend a lot of time and energy trying to convince you um, that you want to avoid all of the investing boogeymen that are out there and you want to stay on track to achieve your long-term investment objectives. And just so you can see some credibility, um, I, we have never called any of the market downturns. We have participated in every market downturn. We have never avoided any of them. This slide shows you all of the market downturns that the prudent speculator has lived through and yet has produced the best long-term returns of any investment publication blowing away the S&P 500. So again, the moral of the story is keep the faith. Um, how do you keep the faith? Well, you keep the faith by using your brain and not your heart <laughs> or some other organ that causes you to panic when things look dicey. So again, fear can't be banished, but you can use reason. And we know that markets are volatile. I mentioned before all those 10% declines that have occurred, but 5% declines occur twice a year on average. Bear markets, 20% declines occur once every three plus years on average. So don't live in fear of the next one. I can assure you it will come. I just can't tell you when it will come. But if you're able to stick with stocks and be invested for the inevitable upturns, you can achieve returns. Well, the value stocks have, have gained 13% plus per annum. Dividend payers, you know, 10% plus per annum. So how do you stay calm? Well, you, you listen to people who tell you that interest rates rising is somehow awful for the market and the market is going to tank because interest rates are rising. Well, market history shows it isn't true. This slide is showing you what happens with value stocks and Fed liftoff when the Fed starts to raise interest rates. What has happened historically one, two, one, three, five years out? And again, stocks have appreciated on average, not every time, no guarantees, but on average, stocks have appreciated. Same thing with dividend-paying stocks. They've appreciated. So again, the historical evidence is what allows you to live through all of the scary things that get thrown at you. And if you don't believe the historical data on the, uh, the Fed, well, open your eyes. Remember the uh, yield on the 10-year on my birthday in 2016, July 8th, was 1.36%. What is it today? 
2.99%. Well, if rising rates equals bad for stocks, what just happened? We went from 2100 on the S&P to 2700 on the S&P. So it's not Homer Simpson of duh, it's duh. The stock market actually has appreciated when interest rates have gone up. So there are people who sit out there on television saying rising rates are bad for stocks. It's not true. <laughs> in theory, it should be true. But in reality, it's not true. Same thing with rising inflation. So we have inflation moving higher, and that's supposed to be awful for stocks. Well, we again crunch all of the data. Inflation in the 2 to 3% range. Historically, these are the subsequent 12-month returns are very good for stocks. So again, if you look at actual data, and if you come to my talk, I have a three-hour, 140-slide presentation tomorrow. Um, if you, if you got to pay for that one. Um, I should get paid for speaking for three hours, but um, we'll s show you all sorts of data that talk about these things. And perhaps my biggest pet peeve are the folks who, who don't understand what a market index is and how its return is calculated. And by that I mean indexes don't account in the actual number of the index, don't account for dividends or dividends reinvested. So you know how I said the Dow you know, averages about 5.5% in price appreciation per year? Well, it's like 9% in total return when you throw in dividends and dividends reinvested. So one of my uh, uh, um, things that has occurred here of lately to really get my uh, ire up was the Wall Street Journal talking about rising inflation. And I know it's hard to see, but down there in the bottom is a quote, you know, saying that, that prices of, of bonds and stocks were devastated because inflation was, was out of control from 1966 to 1982. We had this inflationary spike and we might get another one like that today. And inflation actually averaged 7% a year during that time. So the, the implication was you better protect yourself, get out of stocks for sure, because they're going to be disasters. Well, what happened from 66 to 82? The actual Dow Jones Industrial Average Index went down. The total return on the Dow was okay. Value stocks like those that we favor averaged over a 13% return per year. In an environment where stocks, quote unquote, as measured by the Dow, actually went down. So these are all things that, that trouble me um, from an investor standpoint. I don't like it when people mislead, and they don't always intentionally do it. They just don't understand the way you know, math works sometimes. Um, I also look at the Dow, and of course people have said the Dow is at 20,000, it's too high, and then at 21, 22, and that's why I put all those little dashes through, and Dow 26,000 is not the end. Another of my favorite charts, uh, it's, it's been said that from 1929 to 1954, the Dow went nowhere because the actual index didn't go anywhere, but there were big dividends and those dividends reinvested. You actually would have made a very nice return, as you can see on the right-hand side, by staying invested in a period of time where the Dow supposedly went nowhere. So the next time you hear somebody on television, and there are a lot of smart people who are saying this, that you, know, you could have 25 years of, of negative returns. Well, not if you, throw, if, if you throw away your dividends, yes. If you don't actually collect your dividends, <laughs> then you would have a negative return. But otherwise, it's false. So with all that, I know my time is up, and I'm, I do want to give them a few stock picks because they're going to lynch me if I don't. Um, hopefully you read the quote and you like it and laugh. Most people laugh at this quote. Thank you for reading it. You know, patience is critical in investing. Patience is critical with any stock picks I might give you. I will share with you that a lot of people are concerned about valuation in the market. Um, our portfolios, the stocks that we recommend, generally speaking, trade for far lower valuation multiples, i.e. price earnings, price to book value, price to sales, and they have higher dividend yields than the quote unquote market and even many of the value-based indexes. So don't let anybody tell you that stocks are expensive because we have a portfolio of stocks that we believe are not expensive. And with that, I will throw up some uh, stock picks for you. We've put together a special report for this show 
Um, you got to come to my talks to learn more about how to get said um, report. But I tease you with five of the names on there. And of course, my eyesight is not good enough to read the names right there. But I do have them on here. But it's, it's hopefully you all can read it. Everybody can see that? Nobody can see it? Well, you better come to my talk then. <laughs> oh, now they're going to blow it up so you can read it. I was going to go to tell you when my talk was. That was called a tease in the business. <laughs> but the, 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 the first stock on the list was Allstate Insurance Company. And, the, and we, we chose this list. And, and we'll go back. You can move it back a slide. Um, we chose these stocks because they had a yield of over 2%. They were undervalued. And believe it or not, they were all down on the year. And so often I'm asked, well, you know, what kind of stocks do you like? Well, I like to buy things that are on sale. And yes, we have many companies that have appreciated in price, but if I'm recommending something new to you today, why wouldn't I want you to buy something that's recently gone on sale? So names like Allstate, uh, which is the first one on the list in the insurance space, uh, Amgen, a uh, big pharmaceutical company, Benchmark Electronics, uh, BHE is ticker symbol. These are all stocks that, generally speaking, on earnings got hit. You know, Kim mentioned how good earnings were. Earnings are very good. People just need to be patient for the reaction to it. You know, I know everybody wants to uh, see an immediate, you know, that same day, but give, give stocks time and eventually they will appreciate in value. So with that, I know my time has been up, but I do have, have two talks. Uh, the one that is not going to cost you anything to come to is on the 16th, uh, I guess, and that's at, what time is that, at uh, 2.15. So we hope that uh, I hope to see you all there, and I'll have more of my picks at that. But thank you very much.